guys, what is going on? Ultimately, I cut the power to the entire house, and the sound got louder. In a world that often feels chaotic and uncertain, many who believe in Christianity think the end times are near. These ideas are not new. They are rooted in ancient stories from the Bible, promising a future where sorrow is washed away, leaving only joy and peace. This hopeful end is believed to come suddenly, encouraged by signs foretold in the Bible, some of which appear to be unfolding around us. Ever feel chilled by unexplained happenings that leave questions hanging in the air? Dive into these dark secrets with us and let's investigate if the Bible's prophecies will come true for the future. Navigating the uncertain waters of the 21st century, in today's world, filled with so much unpredictability and turmoil, many followers of Christianity can't help but feel that the final days are just around the corner. This belief isn't new. It goes all the way back to the earliest stories in the Bible, which talk about how the world will end. These stories describe a future where everything bad is wiped away, leading to a world filled with peace and happiness, a future everyone hopes for. The Bible makes it clear that this world will eventually come to an end, and it will catch us off guard. We need to be prepared because, according to the Bible, there are signs that the end is approaching, and some of these signs are happening right now, maybe even closer to us than we realize. Have you noticed any of these signs yourself? It's worth paying attention to. For instance, in 2023, the Philippines faced several natural disasters, including a massive storm that caused a lot of damage. Many people managed to capture footage of this storm, but one recorded something unusual. In the video, there was a sound that resembled a loud trumpet coming from the sky during the storm, which was quite scary. Then, something even weirder happened. A mysterious object flew past his balcony at an incredibly fast speed, going against the wind. And just as this object appeared, a loud noise boomed from the sky. What could explain these strange events? It's not just a simple matter, it's something we need to think about seriously. The Bible has mentioned signs of the end times that seem to match up with what was seen, a big storm a trumpet-like sound from the sky, and an unexplainable object showing supernatural qualities. These events are happening simultaneously. Should we start paying more attention and be more cautious? Is this the sound of God's trumpet and the disaster the Bible talked about? Looking at the world in 2024, we're facing a mix of tough situations, new ideas, and big changes. People are really worried about how false information is spreading fast and how climate change is a big problem that's going to affect us more and more in the future. The Global Risks Report from the World Economic Forum tells us that we're heading into times that could be pretty unstable, with lots of potential for big problems around the world. They asked a bunch of experts, and more than half think we're not in for an easy time over the next couple of years. And looking even further ahead, to about 10 years from now, even more of these experts are expecting things to be pretty rough. But it's not all doom and gloom. There's been some good movement on dealing with climate change. At the big climate meeting called COP28, countries agreed to start a fund that will help places that are really feeling the effects of climate change. This is a big deal because it's about trying to make things fairer for countries that are getting hit hardest by climate change. There's also a lot going on between the US and China, two of the biggest players on the world stage. They're trading a lot, especially energy stuff like LNG, which has made them really important to each other's economies. But it's complicated because they're also not agreeing on a bunch of things, and there's worry that this could lead to bigger problems for the whole world's money situation. When it comes to how the world's economy is doing, things could be better. The World Bank thinks that the global economy is going to grow a little bit slower this year. This slow growth makes it hard to reach big goals that countries around the world have set for making life better for everyone. Basically, if we want to get these things done, we've got a lot of work to do. On the brighter side, 
scientists are coming up with some really cool stuff. They're finding better ways to recycle batteries, which is great for the environment, and there's a lot of progress in making new materials for medical stuff, like implants that can just dissolve in your body instead of having to be taken out by a doctor. Plus, there are some big plans for exploring space, like missions to the moon and even to one of Jupiter's moons. This kind of research isn't just about exploring, it can help us solve problems here on Earth too, CAAS. In short, 2024 is shaping up to be a year full of challenges, but also full of hope and possibilities. It's about dealing with the problems we're facing right now, like misinformation and climate change, while also looking forward to the amazing things we can do with new technologies and cooperation between countries. We've got to keep talking about these issues, thinking carefully about them, and working together to make things better. Talking about the end times brings a certain tension. The Bible describes the end of the world and the beginning of a new heaven and earth in a story that first shows the current world's corruption in a dramatic and destructive way before revealing a new, improved world. Passages like Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation are filled with epic descriptions that could be mistaken for a fantasy or science fiction story, with visions of strange creatures and disasters. Past end time predictions missed the mark. Now let's see if the countdown is a sign of things to come and if we can agree on a date for the end of the world. The countdown to a fresh start. People have made bold claims about when the world will end, often based on these dramatic scenes. But those predicted dates have come and gone, and we're still here, which makes us question these interpretations of the end times. Jesus said we wouldn't know exactly when it will happen, but he mentioned specific signs, suggesting it's getting closer. He compared these signs to birth pangs, painful, intense, but also signaling the start of something new and beautiful. Nowadays, when we look at the news and see all the chaos around us, it's easy to wonder if these are the signs that we're nearing the end times. It feels like we're moving closer to something significant, but we should take a closer look at Jesus' words and how current events might align with his teachings in Matthew 24. He talked about natural disasters like earthquakes and famines as early warnings. Throughout history, Christians have seen these disasters as signs of the end times, showing God's judgment and fulfilling biblical prophecies. Lately, the number and power of these natural disasters have made even more people think they're proof of the end times predictions in the Bible. For example, the increase in hurricanes, wildfires, earthquakes and tsunamis around the world has sparked discussions about their significance in relation to biblical predictions. Hurricane Katrina, which hit the United States in 2005, caused a lot of destruction and was seen by some as a sign of God's judgment, though it's hard to be certain. Similarly, the earthquake and tsunami in Japan in 2011, which killed thousands and caused massive damage, made people wonder about the role of natural disasters in biblical prophecy. And the storm in the Philippines I mentioned isn't an isolated incident. These kinds of events are happening more often and more severely than before. The ongoing climate crisis and its effects like rising sea levels and extreme weather have made many Christians think about how these issues fit into biblical end times prophecies. They see these environmental crises as the earth showing signs of stress, waiting for Christ's return, as mentioned in Romans 8.22. As we continue to face more and frequent severe natural disasters, discussions about their meaning in relation to biblical prophecy are likely to continue. So, what about the strange sound in the sky? Is it really God's trumpet? The Bible talks about amazing signs in the heavens marking the end times. The sixth seal of Revelation describes unprecedented heavenly phenomena that have never been seen since the world was created. The period known as the Great Tribulation starts with these signs, including the opening of the seals that reveal the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the cries of martyrs asking Jesus for justice. Following these events, the sixth seal brings signs and wonders in the sky. Revelation 6.12 14 describes a great earthquake, the sun turning black, the moon becoming red like blood, stars falling to earth, 
and the sky splitting open like a scroll. This dramatic imagery fuels the fascination with apocalyptic signs and offers a scriptural basis for those who see recent events as part of a divine plan. In the Bible, Joel talks about a scary future where the sky and earth change dramatically. He describes a day when the sun will turn dark, the moon will appear as blood, and there will be lots of smoke and fire. This is supposed to happen before a very important and frightening day when Jesus Christ comes back to judge everyone. This event is seen as a big deal, not just because it's scary, but because it's also a sign of hope. Paul, another important figure in the Bible, tells us that when we face tough times, we shouldn't rely on our own strength, but on God's power. This is very encouraging because it means we can overcome big challenges with God's help, especially when things around us seem to get worse. As we get ready for these end times, remembering these predictions and relying on God can make a big difference. The book of Revelation talks about a very hard time on earth called the Great Tribulation, which will be worse than anything we've ever seen. It describes a lot of symbols, but when you understand them, you get a clearer picture of what's going to happen. One key part of Revelation is about seven trumpets that bring different disasters to the world. These trumpets are like alarms that something bad is happening, each one making things worse. But they also answer the prayers of people who have suffered, showing that God listens and responds. Each trumpet causes a different kind of disaster, hurting the earth, the sea, the drinking water, and even the sky. Then things get even scarier with demonic attacks that torture people, but don't let them die. This shows just how bad things can get, but also that God's protection is real for those who believe in Him. What's really interesting is how people react to these disasters. Instead of asking for forgiveness and turning to God, they become even more stubborn and refuse to change. This shows how tough people's hearts can be, and it's a warning to us not to be like that. Before the last trumpet sounds, a lot of things happen, which are detailed in Revelation chapters 10 and 11. The final trumpet signals that Jesus' rule is coming soon, which means the worst is almost over, but there are still big events to come. Now we talk about signs in the sky and what they mean for the future. It's fascinating and a bit scary, but it's something people have wondered about for a long time. It makes you think about whether we expect to see miracles today like people did in the past, and whether our faith has changed. As disasters shake the world, we look up, wondering if the strange signs in the sky mean the end is near. The unexpected role of faith in end times. The Bible talks about special signs in the sky, such as changes in the sun, moon, and stars. These signs are not just random things happening, they are planned by God and mean something important. They are a way for God to send messages to us and the whole world. Jesus mentioned these signs too, saying they show big events coming up, especially ones that signal the end of the world and the completion of God's big plan for all of us. The sun, moon, and stars are usually used to tell time and seasons, but here, they are marking a very special moment in God's plan. For example, the prophet Joel talked about the sun getting dark and the moon turning red before a scary day comes when the Lord arrives. According to the Christian beliefs, these signs are more than just things happening in nature. They represent the dark times coming before God returns. The dark sun could mean the lack of spiritual light in the world, and the red moon might point to fighting and harm happening. Jesus also talked about these signs, saying the sun will get dark, the moon won't shine, and stars will fall from the sky. These events are symbols of the trouble and chaos. The darkness and the stars falling could mean that there will be a lot of confusion and hard times. So what's the point of all these signs? They're not meant to scare us, but to get us ready. They encourage us to do good and live as if God's kingdom is coming soon. But where's the good news in all this? The Bible tells us about a kingdom that God will bring that will last forever and won't be destroyed. It also says that if we stay faithful, even when times are tough, we will be rewarded with life 
forever. These amazing signs in the sky are there to keep our faith and hope strong in Jesus, who guides us, gives us life, and promises to save us from anything bad that could happen. Sure, we might face tough times and feel the weight of the world's problems, but as long as we stay connected to Jesus, we can't be completely beaten down. Even with everything bad happening in the world, we can find peace. A lot of that peace comes from helping others who are really suffering because of wars or natural disasters. Where do they find hope? Through their belief in God and from the help we give them, easing their suffering and helping them rebuild their lives. We're like the bright, wonderful signs in the sky for them. For a long time, people have been scared about the world coming to an end. They've come up with all sorts of stories and ideas about how it might happen, like big floods, fires from the sky, or even comets hitting the earth. But no matter how many times they've said it's going to happen, we're all still here. A while back, people were really worried about the year 1000, thinking it would bring the end. Then, when the year 2000 was coming up, there was a big scare that computers would get confused by the date change and cause all sorts of problems. More recently, some thought the world would end in 2012, based on an old calendar. But again, nothing happened. Even with all our modern science and tools to keep an eye on the sky and what's happening around us, people still get scared when they hear about rare things like four blood moons happening in one year. Some folks known as doomsday preppers even try to get ready for the end just in case. They think it's better to be safe than sorry. What's really behind all these scary stories is fear. People have always been a bit afraid of what they can't control or predict. They try to guess when the end will come, hoping maybe they can avoid it. But the truth is, no one really knows for sure what's going to happen in the future. Life on Earth has been through a lot, including some really tough times, but it keeps going. And as long as there's life, people will probably keep guessing about when it might all end. There have been many times when someone has said the world is going to end on a certain day, but then that day comes and goes, and everything is still here. For example, there was a man who thought he knew exactly when the world would end, not just once, but 12 times. He even wrote a book about it, but his predictions didn't come true. Sometimes groups of people get really worried about these predictions. They might do things like build special shelters or try to find other ways to save themselves. One group even thought that aliens would come to save them if they could just get to the right place at the right time. In the past, people have also gotten scared when they see things like comets coming close to Earth. There was one time when everyone thought a comet's poison gas would wipe out life on Earth. People panicked, buying up things like bottled air. But through all these scares, life on Earth has kept on going. Scientists and leaders remind us that there are real challenges we face, like climate change and the threat of nuclear war. These are things we can actually do something about. For example, we can work to take better care of our planet and talk to our leaders about making the world a safer place. Caught between fear and faith, it's time to ask, how should we truly prepare for the end times? Chasing a green dream on a dead planet. Some people believe in staying hopeful and positive, even when facing big problems. They point out that we've made a lot of progress, like finding cleaner ways to use energy. They think that if we keep working hard and believing in a better future, we can make a difference. Of course, you could hide away in fear, but then you'd miss seeing the beautiful signs in the sky that show God's kingdom is the only thing that will last forever. The story of the second coming is told in detail in the Bible, with a vision of heaven opening and a rider on a white horse who is fair and just, coming to bring justice. This rider, called Faithful and True, has eyes like fire and wears many crowns, showing he is a king above all. He wears a robe dipped in blood and leads the armies of heaven. His job is to defeat the nations and bring about God's rule, showing how much God dislikes sin. In the complex web of beliefs about the end of the world and what leads to it, there's a strong view that our bad actions create a huge gap between us and God. It's like our wrongdoings have pushed God away so far that he can't hear us anymore. Imagine people running towards doing bad things as if they can't wait to cause harm and shed innocent blood. 
It's a picture of a world where people's minds are filled with bad thoughts, and everywhere they go, they leave a trail of mess and destruction behind them. They don't know how to live peacefully and don't care about being fair to others. This paints a picture of God looking down, deeply upset by the mess we've made, using punishments to try and grab our attention, because the alternative, being separated from him forever, is too terrible to think about. And then there's the talk about the end of the world, which has many Christians on edge, wondering if we're close to the time when everything changes and Jesus comes back. With all the disasters and bad news around us, it's easy to think that time might be soon. Some people are taking this very seriously, changing their whole lives. They're moving away from cities to live in isolated places, storing up food and even getting weapons ready. They think this is how to prepare for the worst. But is this really what we should be doing? Should we run away and hide? Or stay and help others around us? The Bible tells us to keep watch, but it also says clearly that no one knows when the end will come, not even the exact time or day. Yes, we see a lot of scary things happening in the world, like famines, earthquakes, wars, and so on. But if we look back through history, we see that tough times have always been part of the human experience. Think about what it was like to be a Christian in ancient Rome, facing death for your beliefs, or when big armies invaded and changed the course of history, or when diseases like the Black Death millions. People back then might have thought the world was ending too. Between the years 1347 and 1352, a terrible plague called the Black Death swept through Europe, about a quarter of its people. Then, jump ahead a few hundred years, and the world was plunged into the horrors of what was called the Great War, where countless young lives were lost, destroying the hopes and dreams of a whole generation. Not long after that, Hitler's rise to power and the expansion of the Third Reich across Germany and Eastern Europe brought about a period of fear and suffering like never before. This brief look into history makes it clear that our times don't have a monopoly on tragedy and terror. History seems to have a way of repeating its worst moments, though they may appear in different forms. Despite this, there's a tendency among some today to think of the latest global crises as signs that the world is coming to an end. For Christians pondering how to react to these so-called end times, the Apostle Peter offers some advice. He wrote about a future where the world would end in flames, with the sky itself tearing apart with loud noises and everything melting in intense heat. It's the type of end-of-the-world scenario that could easily be mistaken for a plot from a science fiction movie. However, Peter's advice to believers wasn't to run away or start hoarding supplies, as if preparing for the world's end. Instead, Peter asks a question that makes you think, if everything around us is going to disappear, how should we then live? He suggests living a life of goodness and devotion, a life that not only looks forward to the end, but also helps bring it closer. This is a viewpoint that goes against today's often pessimistic and self-centered mindset. It suggests that instead of fearing the end and focusing on survival, we should live lives that are meaningful and aim to improve ourselves and the world. Peter's advice, though very old, is incredibly relevant today. It challenges us to consider how to find meaning in a world that often seems just a step away from catastrophe. Some might find Peter's optimistic approach a bit unrealistic, especially when you think about all the terrible things that have happened throughout history. But there's something very appealing about the idea that in the face of the end, what really matters is not how well we protect ourselves, but how well we live our lives. At a time when everything seems uncertain, Peter's message encourages us not to look around in fear, but to look up in hope and strive to be our best, making the world a better place in the process. Diving into faith's deep questions, we explore what staying true to our beliefs really means as the end looms. The lost whispers of individual belief hide in the shadow of collective faith. In the maze of spirituality, where doctrine often tangles with the raw essence of faith, the narrative woven by Peter and Paul offers a peculiarly idyllic, yet somehow naive perspective on what it means to be a Christian in what they term as the end times. 
they assert with a blend of earnest simplicity and a hint of dogmatic assurance that the core of Christian duty lies in practicing holiness and dispensing goodness indiscriminately, and dispensing goodness indiscriminately, as though goodness could be measured and dispersed like the coins of the realm. This quaint notion of working the works of God while daylight prevails carries an underlying suggestion that time is of the essence and the clock is ticking for believers to prove their worthiness through acts of kindness, particularly towards fellow believers. Diving into the heart of their message, there's an almost childlike conviction in the power of asking for salvation as if uttering a few scripted lines with the right mix of humility and belief could unlock the celestial gates. This simplistic formula, admit you're a sinner, declare Jesus as Lord, believe, invite, paints salvation as a transaction, straightforward yet profoundly mystifying. The cynic might wonder about the ease of this process, questioning the depth of transformation it purportedly assures. Paul's musings, shared with the Galatians, amplify this sentiment, nudging believers towards a life of perpetual goodness, with a special emphasis on the community of faith. This raises an eyebrow or two about the exclusivity of this goodness, subtly prioritizing the well-being of those within the fold over the grand tapestry of humanity. It's as though salvation and goodness operate within a bubble, insulated from the complexities and gray areas of real human existence. The narrative then veers into the curious realm of the salvation prayer, a concept that straddles the line between profound spiritual awakening and a mere formality. There's a hint of disillusionment in acknowledging that many who pray this prayer exhibit no tangible change, a stark reminder of the chasm between the idealized version of faith and its lived reality. The discourse on being filled with the Holy Spirit attempts to delve deeper into the spiritual journey, suggesting a repetitive surrender to divine influence as the key to genuine transformation. Yet, this advice with its cyclical nature hints at a continuous struggle for dominance between human will and divine control, raising questions about the authenticity of one's faith if it requires constant reaffirmation. Moreover, the emphasis on communal faith practices, participating in local churches, joining small groups, and fostering vulnerability among believers, while heartwarming, also hints at a subtle insularity. It suggests a prescribed pathway to spiritual fulfillment that revolves around institutional participation and interpersonal openness within a select community, somewhat glossing over the solitary, introspective aspects of faith that many find equally vital. The message we get is to stay very close to our community, to love and support one another every day. This sounds nice, doesn't it? But when we dig a bit deeper, it feels a bit like we're being told to get ready for some big disaster that's just around the corner. It's like telling a group of people that something bad is about to happen, and the only way to get through it is by sticking together and being nice to each other. While it's great to encourage kindness and support within a group, it's interesting to note how much emphasis is placed on doing this to prepare for the end times. It's as if there's a big, scary event coming, and the only way to face it is by being part of a strong, loving community. This approach mixes a bit of worry about the future with the idea that being together is the best way to face whatever comes our way. This whole thing about cheering each other on and sticking together comes across as not just a nice thing to do, but something absolutely essential for survival. It's almost as if we're being told, the end is near, so we better stick together if we want to make it through. This message isn't just about making us feel good, it's about keeping us alert and ready for anything. So when we look at the idea of supporting each other every day without the fancy ending of a video or a request for likes and subscriptions, we really start to think about what this message means. Is it really all about making us better people and preparing spiritually, or is there a hint of trying to keep everyone together and focused on a looming big event? In sum, 
While the advice to be close and supportive is usually seen as positive, the intense focus on doing this as a way to get ready for some big, unknown disaster adds another layer to think about. It makes us wonder if the real point is about keeping the group strong in the face of fear about the future. Whether you're skeptical or a true believer in these ideas, it's clear that having a supportive community is seen as very important, especially when facing uncertain times. This message, even if it's a bit complicated, tells us that sticking together and supporting each other is key. No matter what the real reasons behind it might remember, staying connected and supporting each other is crucial. But why the urgent push? Is it genuine care or preparation for a crisis? Smash that like button, subscribe, and share your thoughts below.